Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical review video on calcium metabolism. All right, so let's start with calcium homeostasis. Um, your serum calcium is maintained at a constant level, and that's the goal of homeostasis of, of calcium is, is to maintain the blood level. So it's not to maintain the bone levels of calcium, but the blood level of calcium. And this is because the cellular and tissue effects of calcium will depend on the blood calcium level within staying in that specific normal range. The adult human body does contain about a thousand grams of calcium, but 99% of it exists as hydroxyapatite salt, uh, which is the crystal that makes bones strong. And so the majority of your calcium is, yes, located in your bones. The rest, the other 1%, is located in, in extra intra and extracellular fluids. Um, and so half of the, the what's circulating in your extracellular fluid, so in your plasma and all that, is going to be protein bound, and the other half is going to be existing as ionized calcium. Your diet is your only source of calcium, and the urine is the only significant way out, is the way calcium is excreted from the body. The calcium's role is so the extracellular calcium, so this is the calcium that is floating around in your blood and plasma, is needed for bone mineralization blood coagulation, and then other functions. Um, intracellular calcium has key roles in muscle contraction, hormone secretion, glycogen metabolism, and cell division. It is also worth noting that blood calcium levels are really important to uh, heart function because the heart muscles need it to contract, and we want our heart to keep contracting. So this diagram um, shows a little bit of the, the hormonal control here um, that is in place to maintain homeostasis or normal calcium levels. So let's start if your calcium levels are too high. Maybe you ingested a bunch of calcium or something and uh, you absorb it and your calcium levels climb. And so uh, your, calc your thyroid hormone, your thyroid uh, gland, which it's not the cells that produce the thyroid hormone, it's the extra follicular cells around the cells that produce thyroid hormone, they are going to sense the calcium level and release calcitonin. Uh, and so calcitonin is going to be released and it will, first thing it's going to do is put that extra calcium into your bones to make them stronger. The other thing it's going to do is going to go signal your intestines to decrease calcium abs absorption and uptake, so just kind of let it pass on through. And the third thing it's going to do is decrease the calcium reabsorption from the urine, just allowing more of it to simply pass into the urine. And that should, in turn, bring your blood calcium levels back down to normal and back to homeostasis. If your calcium levels are too low, because maybe you're not taking in enough calcium, or for various reasons that we'll explore in another video, then um, your parathyroid glands are going to release parathyroid hormones. So the parathyroid glands are these four glands that are on the back of the thyroid, and they sense your blood calcium levels. And when it falls, they release parathyroid hormone. The action of parathyroid hormone is to go into your bones where you've got a bunch of stored calcium, and um, break that hydroxyapatite crystals down and release that calcium so that your blood calcium can be maintained. It will also go over to your intestines and increase calcium uptake in the intestines. You need vitamin D for this to happen, very important. And it will also go to your kidneys to increase the calcium reabsorption from the urine to keep it from leaving in the urine. And then all of that together should allow the calcium levels to rise back up to homeostasis. All right, so let's talk a little about the, about these hormones that are involved in the control of calcium metabolism. So the first one is vitamin D. Vitamin D is a steroid hormone. It's synthesized in the skin following exposure to UVB rays from the sun. So it's a sunshine vitamin. And it's really a vitamin. It's a misnomer because it's really a hormone, but we've named it vitamin D, so vitamin D it is. And... Um, this vitamin is really important to calcium metabolism, but to a horde of other things, such as uh, a healthy immune system. It also contributes to good mood. And um, it could also mean like when the, during the wintertime where there's just less sunshine and we're more indoors, we don't get enough sunshine and we often don't get enough vitamin D can lead to depression during the wintertime and also could lead to just a decreased immunity and more sickness. 
Uh, how it's synthesized is the de novo, so this is the new synthesis of vitamin D will begin in the skin. It takes cholesterol uh, and it transforms into 7 dehydrocholesterol and uh, it transforms it into vitamin D by the action of the ultraviolet light. And then that vitamin D is going to circulate into your bloodstream. Uh, vitamin D can be obtain also from dietary sources so fortified milk so this is milk that you buy that has actually had vitamin d added to it uh, multivitamins you can take a vitamin d through supplement also and then cod liver oil which is an old old timey way to uh, vitamin d and it used to give it to, to make people healthier and that's is because it is a source of vitamin d and some of the other fat soluble vitamins like vitamin a the vitamin D3 as cholecalciferol is really scarcely found in nature. So again, unless it's fortified in a multivitamin or you really like cod liver oil, it's kind of hard to get in your diet. So you really need to get sunshine. Uh, but the major dietary sources are, sources are going to be the internal organs, such as the liver. So if you eat a lot of liver, then you're probably going to get enough, but um, it's probably better to go outside. Seafood is another possible source of vitamin D. The tissues that are involved in its synthesis are the skin, the liver, and the kidneys. I'm going to show you a diagram of that here in just a second. And the tissues that are affected by vitamin D are the gut. Uh, vitamin D allows the gut to absorb calcium. The bones, uh, vitamin D will cause bones to release calcium so that you can maintain your blood calcium levels. And the parathyroid glands where high vitamin D levels will decrease parathyroid hormone secretion. So here it is, our little diagram. So you have your sunshine, and your sunshine shines in your skin, and it takes cholesterol and converts it to 70 hydrocholesterol and into vitamin D. So this happens in the skin. Or you're taking a vitamin D3 supplement, whatever, if you're like, you know, not able to get enough sunshine and stuff, you can supplement in your diet, or maybe you drink a bunch of milk that's been fortified with vitamin D3. Okay. And then it is, uh, carried into the blood through uh, via the chylomicrons or the vitamin, vitamin D binding protein and it goes to the liver um, and in the liver converts it to 20, 25 vitamin D um, hydroxy vitamin D and um, using the this enzyme here and then that floats over to the kidneys and the kidneys are going to use the, this next enzyme here to convert it to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D and this 125-dihydroxy vitamin D is the active form of vitamin D. The parathyroid hormones, other hormones really important in calcium metabolism. It is secreted from the four parathyroid glands that are adjacent to the thyroid gland. They're stuck kind of all on the back of this uh, the thyroid gland and uh, the parathyroid glands have calcium sensing receptors and they respond to calcium levels by increasing or decreasing parathyroid hormone secretion. So what they're, the, what these parathyroid gland um, calcium sensing receptors are looking for is a specifically a decrease in calcium levels and blood calcium levels and that would cause a release of the parathyroid hormone to increase them and then if the calcium levels are, are high then that would greatly decrease the secretion of parathyroid hormone. The function of parathyroid hormone so it stimulates bone resorption and the release of calcium into the blood and it acts on the kidneys to increase the reabsorption of calcium the renal tubular calcium and put it back into the blood it increases phosphate excretion, so calcium and phosphate will um, also move in opposite directions. And um, it will also enhance the 1 alpha hydroxylation of 25 dihydroxy vitamin D into 1 2 5 dihydroxy vitamin D, which basically means it activates vitamin D, helps with this activation of vitamin D. Um, all of these functions are aimed to raise blood calcium and are mediated again via specific parathyroid hormone receptors. So a little bit about organ physiology and calcium metabolism. So uh, the GI system. So the factors that are required for calcium absorption in the GI tract, which would be absorbed obviously in the small intestine because that's where everything is absorbed. So first you need normal intestinal functions. So if you have short bowel syndrome or any genetic or physiologic effect, all of those can have negative effect, including a lot of the you know, inflammatory bowel disorders, irritable bowels, um, surgeries, and things that would disrupt the length uh, in the, the small intestine where absorption takes place. 
you need obviously to have adequate dietary calcium intake um, and calcium is not only found in milk products but in a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables and things like that so you just have to make sure you get enough calcium in your diet but then you also need enough vitamin D to uh, absorb that calcium so if you are vitamin D deficient then um, the calcium will not be adequately absorbed in the small intestine and then the kidneys um, diseased kidneys will impair calcium metabolism because the kidneys can choose to secrete, you know, get rid of extra calcium through the urine or reabsorb it, put it back into the blood. So hypercalcemia, whether it's a result of autonomous overproduction of parathyroid hormone, which is primary hyperparathyroidism, or from other causes, will increase the filtered load of calcium, meaning there's more calcium going through the kidneys and ending up in the urine. And that also increases the chance of the formation of a calcium-based kidney stone, such as, for example, those calcium oxalate kidney stones. And lastly, a little bit on bone physiology. Uh, bone turnover, called remodeling, is a couple process of bone formation and breakdown that occurs throughout life. So basically, just think about it as like remodeling a home. You're, you're actually always remodeling your bone. So, so you're getting rid of some and rebuilding and get rid of them. And, and there's about a 3 to 5% calcium turnover in your bone, burn turnover uh, every year uh, throughout your life. And um, you want this to be pretty even and not be losing bone mass. The bone formation is always mediated by osteoblast. So if you want to think blast or building bone and the bone breakdown or bone resorption is always mediated by osteoclast. So they are destroying bone, taking it down. When a resorption exceeds the formation of bone, then your bone mass decreases and you have uh, osteoporosis and increased risk of fracture. There are two main types of bone in the skeleton. The cortical, which is the primary type in the long bones and femur, it is strong and rigid uh, and it's solid looking like right here uh, and it's what makes your bones strong and keeps them from breaking. And then the trabecular is this um, like lattice work of little bone um, pieces here and it is found in the actual skeleton in the vertebrae. Uh, and it has many crosshair types of connections that are called trabeculae, and it provides strength and elasticity. It also makes your bo bones lighter, makes them not so heavy, plus uh, it gives room for blood circulation for uh, marrow and all that kind of stuff. All right, and that's the end of this review. Thank you.